I'm called Bob and Roberta Smith. But there's actually only one of me. I'm an artist, and I'm best known for painting slogans like this. We've only got each other. Growing up, I always wanted to change the world. But recently, I've been starting to lose faith in the power of protest. Then, this summer, the world seemed to go protest mad in a frenzy of popular revolt. From Brexit to anti-austerity marches and the mass protest vote that was Donald Trump, and even the people of Iceland rising up against their government. The barrier between the parliament and the people just got toppled down. So I thought I should dip my toe back in the protest water to find out if it's anything more than a futile shouting match, or if we're entering a new era where social media and a new mood of popular outrage is making protest a real force for change. The pin badges of the 1980s has been replaced by hashtags. All this spirited rebellion reminded me of the great successes of 20th century protest, when mass demonstrations helped free Nelson Mandela and stop the poll tax. But back then, protests still seemed part of a democratic machine people actually believed in. Today, I've got a horrible feeling that for many, this outbreak of popular revolt is as much a howl of frustration at the failure of liberal democracy itself. I'm here to protest an illegal government. So to work out what the hell is going on, I'm going to crisscross the globe in search of agitators, activists, and protesters everywhere. The two groups are just ranged to shout at each other, and they'll go on indefinitely. From Black Lives Matter to angry English grannies, gun-toting Americans. This is an American-made AKM. OK. Would you like to go shoot sometime? <laughs> to the most English of grassroots protest. I am prepared to take up the cudgels for the underdog. And we are the underdog on this occasion. All to try and understand whether protest can still change the world, or at least a little corner of it. My artworks are inspired by protest placards, but they are not protests in any straightforward sense. My most famous slogan, Make Art Not War, was really conceived of as a parody of the idea that art can change the world. My protesting hit its peak in 2015 when I started my own one man, one issue party, the Art Party. Smith for art in our school. Here I am driving my van on the campaign trail. The Prime Minister yesterday said... I was so upset with the Philistine Michael Gove and his art cutbacks, I ended up standing against him in the general election. I got 273 votes, he got 32,000 votes. <laughs> After that mauling by Gove, I decided it was best to back a winner and campaign for Britain to stay in the EU. We are stronger together, Remain. I painted this in the last days of the Remain campaign, and it did make me think that if you get Bob involved in the campaign, you're doomed. <laughs> I retired from frontline politics after Brexit and decided to spend more time with my band. We're called the Apathy Band, and when we can be bothered, we make protest records. We're not Woody Guthrie, John Lennon, or even Billy Bragg, but we try to do our bit. Party that became so powerful. Billy sung more protest songs than I've painted protest placards, and his music has turned generations of teenagers onto politics. So before I begin my odyssey of activism, I want to ask him if he thinks artists can actually change things. Billy, I want to play you my, my protest record. Brilliant. You made a protest record. I have. So I'm just going to... Travel everywhere. Three, go to the local museum. Four, go out every night. Museum. You haven't quite got 13, the hang of rapping, have you? Listen to Nina Simone. <laughs> 40, listen to Don Cherry. Is there a chorus? Letters it's coming, it's coming. Yeah. I mean, the music's on the other I'd side. Like to hear it. 
You want to hear the music? Yeah, I do, yeah. <laughs> Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. My advice, having heard that, will be stick to fucking painting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been trying to, uh, you know, advocate to the government that they ought to have art and music in schools in the national curriculum. Amen to that. I even stood in the uh, 2015 election against Michael Gove. Is that art or is that politics? Well, that's a good point. I mean, I claim that it was an artwork. Yeah, but that's just taking the piss. <laughs> the reality was you do take on the responsibility for bringing about change, and that's a positive thing, and I salute you for doing that. Is all great art protest. All great art gives you a different perspective on the world, but the annoying aspect of it is it has no agency. And to imagine that it ever could is to, to really defraud people. I don't think your music has agency. No, 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 no. I speak from experience. It's the music of Bob Dylan that's had agency. It's not agency, it's a, it's a signpost. We've all heard a song and it's galvanised us. We know that music does have a power, but it's not that power, Bob. Only the audience can change the world, Bob. Trust me, I've really tried. I have really tried, all right? And I speak as someone who believed the Clash were going to change the world, OK? But change the world? It's like saying jackets change the world, mate. I think Billy's been a bit defeatist, but he's got a point when he says only people can change things. And the first step on the way to change is protest. So let's go and find some protesters. We had stamped out fascism. It's exactly three weeks after Brexit. I do not think it would be right for me to try to be the captain that steers our country to its next destination. Cameron is gone. And pleasingly for me, Gove went too. Thank you very much, thank you. It's all a bit of a mess, and trust in politicians is lower than ever. The perfect time for protesters to take to the streets. So I'm here to see what a great British protest looks like. A far-right group, the South East Alliance, is planning a march to get Article 50 triggered immediately. But Paul belongs to Unite Against Fascism. He believes the South East Alliance are using the referendum-winning message of taking back control to promote a racist agenda. Your polls apart in terms of politics, but is there any conversation between you? No, not at all. We, you know, you, you don't talk to, to open fascists. These people want to use the referendum result as a way of stirring up racial hatred. So we're here to say, Whatever you do on the referendum, we're not going to allow a, a group of fascists to get to where they've got to in the likes of Le Pen in France, or Greece, or Jobbik in Hungary. We're not going to have it here. And how are you going to make that a reality? We'll try and drown them out. Fascists gone! All fascists! Fascists gone! All fascists! Fascists gone! We asked the South East Alliance for an interview, but despite our best efforts, they stopped replying to our messages. It feels a bit like an angry football crowd, really. Two views completely opposed to each other, uh, giving it to each other in no uncertain terms. The Black Lives Matter march uh, seems to have arrived and now they've joined their forces to uh, shout at the uh, South East Alliance. Seems like the two groups have just ranged to shout at each other and that will go on indefinitely. I do think there is a value to the counter-protesters turning up here tonight. It's democracy on a very basic level, I suppose. 
But there is something a bit depressing and pointless about all these voices simply drowning each other out. I'm an English citizen, mate. I'm an English... To investigate how protest is changing, I decided I had to escape these shores and head to America. It's a country founded on dissent and rebellion, and today it's home to many of the world's most innovative, outrageous, and to some, most dangerous protest movements. I really love New York in the late 1980s when I lived here. I realized on some level it was all about free speech. America is founded on an idea about free speech. It's founded on an idea about independence and the rights of man. And uh, it's a unique kind of place. You know, Woody Guffey sings, this land is uh, my land, this land is your land. Uh, and that's what all Americans think. It's early July, and the presidential election is being hijacked by a man so far outside mainstream politics, he could have come from Mars. Donald Trump is riding on a populist tide that's about to see him win the Republican nomination. And for me, the way he's doing it makes a mockery of the great tradition of popular protest in America that hit its peak with the anti-war and civil rights movements of the 1960s. So I'm going to visit a guru of radical protest, Noam Chomsky. His political writing has inspired everything from the anti-Vietnam movement to Occupy, and I'm interested to know what he makes of this current epidemic of popular unrest. Do you feel that the American public might be protesting by voting for Donald Trump in the upcoming election? There's a protest there against uh, what's been happening to people who've been pretty much left by the wayside uh, during the neoliberal periods. Say 60% of Trump voters, Trump supporters, are uh, white working class. Uh, these are people who've really taken it in the neck in the last generation. Uh, they're rather similar to the demographic that uh, voted for Brexit. Uh, they've uh, their uh, jobs have been taken away, their hopes have been taken away, their dignity has been taken away. Just in the 1960s, you, uh, there might have been a protest, and CBS or NBC or the BBC might have turned up and covered it. Uh, how, does, how has protest changed in the age of the, the, the digital world and the, and the fragmentation of the media? Well, first of all, there's a lot of illusions about the 1960s. Uh, <laughs> take take anti-war protest, mm. okay? Mm. Uh, it's true that by 1968 and 1969, uh, when you had uh, you know, a million people in Washington, yeah, then there was coverage. What about the years that preceded? Uh, I mean, I was giving talks in people's living rooms. That's the kind of protest there was. I think it's easier now. The women's movement, the uh, anti-racist movements, the environmental movements, uh, opposition to aggression has increased significantly. Uh, the 1960s set off processes which did lead to more civilized societies. In 1969, Chomsky was writing books like American Power and the New Mandarins, warning us how the technocratic elites were taking over the world. Well, he was right, of course, but unfortunately for Noam, we weren't listening. 1969 was also the year of John and Yoko's cheeky anti-Vietnam bedding, and they grabbed all the headlines. John and Yoko's brand of celebrity performance protest and Chomsky's radical critique of neoliberal economics was entertainingly combined in 2011 by artist Zephy Throwell's mischievous performance on Wall Street called Ocular Patient. An artwork credited with inspiring Occupy, the movement that was so literally to occupy Wall Street only months later and completely transform modern protest. Should we, should we have a seat? So, Jeffrey, I want to ask you, can you tell me about ocular partation? Okay, it's called ocular patient. Ocular partation, oh, sorry, not ocular partation, <laughs> ocular patient. I organized 50 people, right, to come out 
and reenact the, the professions of Wall Street. What? Yeah, except in the noon. 7 a.m., everybody comes out of the train, right? And they start uh, doing their job. We've got sweepers, bankers, traders, FedEx, prostitutes, hot dog salesmen, the whole works, right? Little did I know this was what would become Occupy. Occupy Wall Street all day, all week. A month after Ocular Pation left Wall Street, a group of young people arrived to protest against what Chomsky had written about all those years ago. The General Assembly at Occupy Wall Street and Liberty Plaza is a form of direct democracy. For them, the banking crisis had confirmed the US government was really run by corporations. They were angry and they weren't leaving. Occupy marked a new era of protest through video streams, Twitter and YouTube uploads. They used social media to spread the message, though it didn't happen overnight. Did you feel that Occupy was a kind of game changer that would be replicated around the world at the time? No. I thought that it was one of the most disorganized things I'd ever seen. I remember sitting there for three hours with people just yelling at each other. And then this slowly and slowly became something more and more. You know, people from all over the world started showing up. Did Occupy make any kind of difference? Absolutely. Yeah. Protest movements up to that point had been anemic, and this brought protests back to the forefront. I've been protesting to try and save the arts in schools in the UK. Can you give me any tips? What should I be doing? Should I stay fully clothed? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> in only three years, Occupy grew into a political protest movement with over 800 active camps around the world. A thousand people got 77 billion pounds richer last year. And it inspired thousands of other groups to scream about the injustices of inequality and corporate power in their own corners of the world. I'm back in the UK and I'm meeting a group of protesters who were first politicised by Occupy. They're not students, they don't wear masks or know how to hack computers, but they do have passion, energy and bus passes. I'm off to catch up with the frack fighting nanas over tea. Shall I be mum? You can be mum. <laughs> Is fracking just the latest protest in a lifelong no, series I've, of protests that you have been taking I've part in? I've never protested before. No, no none of us have. have I have been a school governor, a teacher. I have two children who went to private school. I am really a, a, an atypical protester. Does the fact that you don't present the expected image of the protest to the public give you a special power? If something's stuck, you need something different to happen. I think we can be a little bit unsettling and unnerving and a change from what you expect to see, and that when that happens, you can break a cycle with that. In 2014, the Nanas successfully occupied a field earmarked for fracking in Lancashire. They camped out for three weeks, overcoming fracking developers who threatened them with legal action and even a herd of cows. They also developed a non-aggressive way of dealing with authority that Gandhi himself would be proud of. I've said to the police before, you ought to be careful. You know, she's 84, she's got very brittle bones. If you touch her, she may just shatter. And then I've said before, um, she's got a colostomy bag on today and it's quite full. I'd handle with care. Who's the audience for what you're doing? The investors, who are the lifeblood of this, are the ones we hope to deter. And we watched a shale gas conference that was live streamed, and they said that they felt that perhaps it would be better to move their actions to Yorkshire rather than to try Lancashire again because the resistance there was so strong and so great. Do take a scone with you. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> no fracking anywhere! No fracking Yorkshire! So far, the Nanas have managed to keep the frackers out of Lancashire. Today, they're out in support of an anti-fracking protest in Yorkshire. They really do stand out in the crowd, like a group of angry yellow Hilda Ogdens. But this isn't all just thrown together. It's the same sense of clever, playful branding we saw on Wall Street in 2011. Did you take on board that idea from the Occupy movement? Oh, yeah, God, absolutely. And, in fact, I contacted a guy from the Occupy movement because I wanted to do it within a lawful civil action without committing a criminal offence. 
The Nanas might seem homely, but don't be deceived. They're a very slick multimedia operation with a unique image and message. If the Nanas are out and about, you can't avoid them or forget them, even if you don't agree with them. Would you say they were your sort of people? Or... Not really, no. No, <laughs> no. They're quite hippified, you know what I mean? They're quite, you know, they're quite down with it. But I don't think they represent the true Yorkshire people, you know what I mean? Have you ever been on a protest? No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> I think like everybody here, we're not in this out of choice. We are in this out of obligation to our children and their children. These marches take quite a long time and there are lots of speeches. There are people here from Rydale, Nidderdale, Wensydale, Wharfdale. There are people from the North Riding, the West Riding, the East Riding. They've all got to give a speech. They're all absolutely the same. <laughs> The glorious yellow nanas are the one exception. Partly inspired by Occupy, partly by no-nonsense Yorkshire bolshiness, they prove you don't have to be a young geek to be at the cutting edge of contemporary protest. Buoyed by the nanas' can-do brand of local activism, I'm heading south to Newnham in Surrey. The village has only got one protest group. Its aim? To save the local pub. It's a small protest, but it says big things about a certain kind of British protester. June. The world is in turmoil at the mo it moment. Is. Everything's been turned upside down. We've had Brexit. Why should people care about the pub? Because it's part of English life. Without it, the village becomes a bit soulless. My son makes a souffle because he was taught to make it in the pub. It's a training it's, centre, yeah. really. It's a training centre, yeah. <laughs> Once they take it away, we can't have it back. Yes, and I feel frustrated that the people who are trying to do it don't really know what, what they're taking away from us. The pub's owners, Red Oak Taverns, say they pride themselves on their strong relationships with pub partners and empathise with residents of Newnham. They say the pub was closed when they bought it and independent studies show it is not viable to run without making a loss. Undeterred, the community is still fighting. Nearly 60 years ago, I gave my best man and the four ushers lunch here before going over to Wood and St Lawrence to get married. So how far would you go? Would you march on Basingstoke with placards? I'm not going to set myself on fire um, <laughs> or do anything like that, but, um, yeah, I support the local community. I think if something's worth fighting for, you should fight for it. Where necessary, I'm prepared to take up the cudgels for the underdog. And we are the underdog on this occasion. I've decided to help the villagers of Newnham with their protest. First of all, I think they might need an online strategy in the style of Occupy and Black Lives Matter. These days, protests can gain visibility across the world in just a few hours. I'm meeting a psychologist who's been researching how to make protests go viral in what he calls, rather charmingly, I think, a social media shitstorm. What really ignites a shitstorm? You should be able to quite easily understand it, and the shitstorm should be able to make you angry. You shouldn't just tell, give people a fact you should also tell them what they should think about that fact. Otherwise, they have to think so much and they might form their own opinions and you don't want that. God forbid. And then it has to pass this social filter. Is how will I look if I click, actually click on this and, and show the world that I care. So, Anders, uh, some people in Newnham, in Hampshire, they need your help. I've, I've got these signs here. I want to create an image that will go viral. So this one's simple, just save our pub. But it doesn't really stir many emotions. No. The law is there to help protect the social asset of that pub. Oh, it's getting a lot too complicated. So what kinds of slogans should we be using? I just joined a page or a group saying, we must stop big money from, from cutting up our social fabric. Most likely, people that I know who live on a complete other side of the country might say, yes, yes. When you frame it like that, what you have to consider if you want to engage people, you're going to ask yourself, 
how much, how far are you willing to turn yourself to the dark side? <laughs> I've gone for Stop Big Money Destroying Britain, but I think I need a really incendiary image to get this shitstorm going. So I'm going to post this, and hopefully that will cause a shitstorm. In the meantime, I want to discover a little more about the fine art of rural rebellion. The villagers' protest is all about defending a traditional way of living in the face of unwanted progress. We saw similar sentiments expressed on a larger scale by the Countryside Alliance. So to discuss what well-mannered countryside rebels have in common with the global protest movement, I'm meeting philosopher, traditionalist and poster boy for respectable English protest, Professor Roger Scruton. Roger, I wanted to ask you when you think of protest, who do you think of? I think there are two kinds of protester. There's the, the, the one who protests within the framework of the law and, uh, and genuine old-fashioned patriotic values. And then there's the kind of protester who thinks that uh, he's entitled to overthrow everything and to behave in a way which defies the law. I know you were involved a little bit with the Countryside Alliance protests. Right. I mean, did, did, you see, did you identify as a protester in that oh, moment? Oh, totally. These were people wanting to retain a tradition and an institution which, were, which mattered to them. 500,000 of us converged on London, mostly in three-piece suits, and, you know, and people had a picnic in the park, and they all cheered and went home. That, that sort of protest is very much in the English spirit. Uh, and uh, you can't in any way compare it with the street riots in, uh, in Paris in 1968. <laughs> we are a curmudgeonly and difficult nation. We don't accept being bossed around. I and mean, indeed, that's what the referendum was really about, you know, not being bossed around by Europe. And so we do protest, but we do protest within the law. I think we should be proud of that. I'm not with Roger in thinking that the EU is the big bad wolf here, but I do agree the vote was a cry of frustration and powerlessness uniting large numbers of disenfranchised working-class voters with parts of Conservative England that Roger speaks for. The people have spoken. After more than four decades, the UK will leave the European Union. The Prime Minister has resigned. The Leave campaign adopted the language of protest. Nigel Farage painted himself as a leader of the people against the establishment, playing on the loss of hope many ex-industrial communities felt around the UK. I can't stand the man, but he is a consummate performance artist. The next stop on my world tour of protest is Ohio, where the Republicans have come to anoint their presidential candidate. I'm wondering how much Brexit voters have in common with Trump supporters, as Noam Chomsky was claiming, and why so many Americans seem to be following Donald Trump as if he's leading the biggest mass protest in the country's history. As I arrive in the baking heat, news breaks of a shooting. An absolutely unspeakable, heinous attack on law enforcement here in Baton Rouge claimed the lives of two Baton Rouge police officers yeah, it's quite daunting. We've just arrived in Cleveland. This idea that we're going to look at protests suddenly seems much more charged in this atmosphere. We're driving a car into what could be a bit of a cauldron. You are not allowed to carry a tennis ball or indeed a piece of wood near the convention center, but you can carry a gun. So uh, personally, I'm a little bit anxious and trepidatious about that. And judging by the atmosphere in downtown Cleveland, I'm not sure if I'm in an action movie or a Western. Trump is the talk of the town, and it's pretty clear he's going to be nominated. Desmond, are you a Trump supporter? No, I am a, I'm a supporter of the people who support Trump. How much is an American flag? Right now, the way sales are, it's three bucks. Really? <laughs> Are the Republicans not dipping into their pockets and buying your stuff? It's not trickling down. No trickle down <laughs> economics. <here. laughs> no. <laughs>
Trump supporters are rallying on the edge of town, and I feel like I'm about to walk into a very carefully choreographed media shitstorm. We've come to Settlers Landing here, but there are many more media than there are Trump supporters. In fact, to hunt one out might be quite difficult, I can see. We're standing in a queue behind uh, NBC, French News. <laughs> Hello, I'm making a programme with the BBC. We're covering the convention. Hi, I wonder if I could interview you just quickly. I'm, I'm talking to this guy. Oh, are you talking? Oh, sorry, I'm terribly okay. sorry, yes. I hope we're prepared to keep something from the world. Are you here to support your man, Trump? <laughs> no, I'm here. I'm here in a similar capacity to you. All right, OK. All right. So far, my fears about firearms are being confirmed. Judging by the number of guns on show, this is a rather more heavily armed protest than I'm used to, and their demands seem pretty uncompromising too. Trump supporters aren't protesting just to change a few laws. They're more like an army of resistance against a democratic regime they don't feel represents them. I'm just wondering, you know, why are you here today? We're protesting that, you know, they don't really care about what we think. They think they, they can do everything. I feel like it's more like your Brexit. You know, the Brexit was them saying, like, hey, we don't want this authoritarian bureaucracy that we didn't actually vote for. You've got the peace sign, you've got, you know, you've got the hair, you've got the feathers and stuff. It, you could be somebody from Woodstock. Yeah, I got a whole hippie soul, what but, yeah. can I say? I'd understand all this better if Trump supporters were all hippies, still a bit rosy from the 70s. And to the Republic. I don't doubt these people love their country, but there's no love left for the traditions of liberal democracy. And justice for all. They're clearly here to protest. Yes, I do. I think it would be a protest. Yeah, I'm here to protest an illegal government. I call myself a patriot. You're a patriot. I call myself an uh, America-loving individual. I'm not a radical protester or anything like that. I, I'm just a person who feels that we're, we're going in the wrong direction, and we have been for quite some time. It's like a zombie Woodstock here, with guns instead of guitars. And even if Trump isn't the kind of act I'd be getting excited about, like the best performers, he clearly makes his fans feel good about themselves and their country. Personally, I feel a bit ill. But every corner of Cleveland is alive with agitators and activists, and they aren't all here to rally around Trump. Make some noise for profits of rain! And we're going to let those mother f the RNC know that we've had enough of their bullshit. This is a field of pogoing progressives and radicals. It actually reminds me of my youthful protest years. There's energy underlaid by gnawing fear that if the noise stops, the world might go belly up. Party's over and done. But what messages do the anti-Trumpists want us to hear? Hey, I'm from the BBC. My name's Bob and Roberta Smith. That was a How's fantastic gig. Thank you very much. I literally had to catch up with Tom Morello, rock god and political activist, as he walked very fast. The message that's going to be happening inside the arena the next four nights is going to be a message of uh, thinly veiled racism, thinly veiled misogyny, and open call for war crimes as foreign policy. That's what's going to be happening inside. We have a countervailing message here on the street that's about human rights and resistance to oppression. Do you think artists and musicians can be central to a kind of campaign against Trump? There's never been a successful social movement in this country that hasn't had a great soundtrack. <laughs> Now, it does seem a bit more edgy. It looks like a fight is breaking out, but it's actually a huge scrum of journalists desperate for a shot of two men arguing over a flag. We've got the police, yeah. we've got the military, yeah. we've got the media, we've got the pro-Trump people, we've got the anti-Trump people. Which do you think is the biggest group? The police. 
right when those cops were moving in on those protesters, the news spread from Kansas that an officer had been shot, critically injured. And so cops here moved in. They were worried about a copycat here in Cleveland. So, you know, it's tense. There's a lot going on in America and there's a lot on people's minds. This has really been about people doing things for people like us, hasn't it? For the media. There's the man walking around here with the, you know, the assault rifle strapped over his shoulder. And yeah, he's the one getting all the interviews. Sorry, I can't resist either. Now, Jesse, I don't suppose you would call yourself a protester. No. But you are making a point, aren't I you? Am what indeed. is the point that you're making? Uh, the point that I'm making is simply that we have constitutional rights that are protected by a federal constitution. And one of those is owning firearms. And the instant you stop practicing those rights is the instant those rights go away. I mean, is there something in your sort of journey or DNA that, that makes you kind of think, I'm going to do this? Well, I've been very, very closely following politics for a long time. And I've been shooting since I was five, so it's only natural that those two things kind of come to some congruence, specifically in this instance. Well, I don't know what weapon this is. This, this is an American-made AKM. OK. Would you like to go shoot sometime? <laughs> I've now been sucked into the media circus, just like everyone else. The Westboro Baptist Church have travelled here from Kansas to broadcast their notoriously homophobic message. They use the language of protest, but their placards ignite the same kind of debate we have about art. Is freedom of expression without limits? Or does there come a point where displaying a message crosses over into incitement to hatred and violence? Why have you come to the Republican National well, Convention? We're going to hold up the sign, like this sign right here, that says same-sex same marriage dooms nations. Some people would say that, that that sign is an incitement to violence. And perhaps well, not anybody the who's got any sense. The, the media's relationship in broadcasting these signs and your story around the world right. uh, is part of the reason why yeah. a man went in and shot all those people. And you're normalizing you a situation. Out of that? Where is the word shooting or violence or take any action? That sin dooms your nation. If that scares you, you might be a little thin-skinned for the job. So. If I was a media <laughs> strategist and you wanted to uh, really increase your profile, you would change no, your message. You. you would say, we're, we're going to message. actually, we're going to actually uh, preach a message okay. of love. But, and then suddenly the people, see, all, all the media those... suddenly would be here going, well, no, they they, the, no, they the Westboro you know Baptist why? Church no, have changed wouldn't. their tune. What is, in that sense, your USP that distinguishes you from other churches that promote love? God you... hates fags. Repent or perish. Who's saying that? No one. That's incendiary. That's incitement well, to violence. you call one guy's incendiary is another guy's hope. And that's just the way it is. Let's leave it there, Mark. There we shall. <laughs> OK, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. There are some pretty unpleasant uh, ideas being aired at this event. I think the Westboro Baptist Church are hijacking the language of protest. And they understand something very clear, is that uh, protest is always about who's listening. Most often, who's listening is the lens and a microphone, and that's the means of their distribution. Now I feel quite angry, and there's a lot of uh, adrenaline flowing around my body. But I'll have a nice tea and calm down, and I'll be OK. Cleveland showed me how the mainstream media still plays an essential role in modern protest. But the recent rise of one movement without access to the mainstream shows how it can be bypassed altogether. Black Lives Matter started out as a hashtag and became a major force through social media. The movement came to worldwide prominence through the widespread sharing of camera phone footage showing the tragic killings of unarmed black men by police officers. But today, suddenly, the mainstream media has focused on them. The big networks are linking Black Lives Matter to the shootings of police officers in Baton Rouge that I heard about when I arrived. Blair Imani was at the Black Lives Matter protest in Baton Rouge before the police officers were shot. She was arrested and jailed. 
Immediately, media was trying to imply that the protest that I had participated in was the cause of the officers being shot. And we knew that not to be the case. The perception of Black Lives Matter amongst some of America's mainstream politicians has been pretty negative. Across history, anytime there's been a group of black folks who have spoken out against injustice, they come under very harsh scrutiny from the dominant culture. My uncle was a Black Panther, and my father, instead of going to the Vietnam War, he did the Peace Corps. And so we've always kind of grown up with this perception that if you are given the tools and the resources to affect change and you're not, you're doing a disservice to the world. It's incredible to me that Blair and her comrades are protesting for the same things their parents fought for in the 60s and 70s. The difference is today we can see them protest real time over the internet. As I returned to the UK, Black Lives Matter was hitting the headlines here too through attention-grabbing stunts blocking the road to Heathrow and the runway at City Airport. Social media protests can grow fast, but I'm not sure that makes them any more successful. What I'm interested in is the process that turns protest into actual change. I'm dropping in on Professor Eliza Philby, one of those experts we were warned about. If you look back in history, it's very clear that fringe ideas that people easily dismissed as ridiculous, unsavoury, impossible, gradually through protest, through mobilisation of people, through growing solidarity, through legitimising their cause to the public, the media and the political and legal establishment can become mainstream causes. Now you could cite gay marriage and gay rights as that, but you could equally cite Brexit. So what does it take for a protest to really break through into the public consciousness and speak to politicians? The involvement of moderates, mass mobilisation of people, a sympathetic media, and also there has to be a specific goal in mind. The really hard part comes for protesters is keeping it in the news agenda. <laughs> we have short <laughs> attention spans. An almost textbook example of how a protest movement can build the momentum for change that Eliza describes is happening now in Iceland. Well, it reminds me of Lincolnshire so far. The Lincolnshire after a nuclear holocaust. Ever since the bankers left the national economy in tatters, people here, like everywhere else, have been distrustful of the establishment and determined to keep them in check. Earlier this year, the Panama Papers revealed Iceland's Prime Minister had money hidden away in offshore bank accounts. The story was broken in a television interview broadcast to the nation. Mr Prime Minister, what can you tell me about a company called Vintris? Well, uh, um, it's a... You don't see politicians skewered like this too often. It's a nice moment. Now I'm starting to feel a, a bit strange about these questions. What followed was one of the fastest growing protest movements in history and led Iceland's Prime Minister to resign. But it was planned in a pretty low-key way from this square outside Parliament. I'm meeting two of the organisers of the protest. Hi, Sara. Hi. <laughs> oh, oh, hi. Good to hi. see you. Hi, Bob. Hi. Lovely to see you. Great. So I've never sat down with two people who've caused the Prime Minister to resign before. How did that come about? Well, protests, I would say, and it's not two people that did it. It was a large portion of the country. Do you feel that your protest is being heard? The fact that you're sitting opposed, opposed to me here asking me that question make, is a clarification and a confirmation that it's a yes. So your generation does feel that you can make change? Us cr crazy lot feel that we can, and we're trying to <laughs> convince our generation. <laughs> Definitely. And you were right here. What was, the f what was the sense in the crowd? Well, I think initially it was a bit of disbelief because it actually was working. It kept getting bigger, it kept being more persistent. They couldn't brush it off, they couldn't ignore it. The usual excuses were gone. It was a proving point that yeah. we actually can make a difference. We, the people, can. Yeah. We actually did that. Awesome. 
It was glorious. It was an ocean of people everywhere. So what's changed? There's been an awakening. There wasn't a kind of culture of protest here in Iceland. The barrier between the parliament and the people just got toppled down. Sindri and Sara's success seems to reveal something crucial about protest. You can try as hard as you like for as long as you like, but for a protest to really take off, it has to capture the mood of the nation. And seizing that zeitgeist, an outsider political party has been growing in popularity. As you can see from its parliamentary office, the Pirate Party is not your average political party. <laughs> but where does protest end and politics begin? I'm meeting the party's most prominent member, Birgitta Jonsdotter, to find out how protesters can become politicians. Can a protester become a part of the establishment? I don't know. I am a natural-born protester and anti-authoritarian, so... I think it's always necessary to have people protesting in any different, like, possible ways. Uh, outside, inside, uh, on the side, uh, from the top and the bottom, uh, because uh, the only way to keep people honest is if they know somebody is actually monitoring what they're doing. Is the Pirate Party just riding a wave of disaffection? Uh, we're not like UKIP. There are other models where you can actually inspire people to come and participate in co-creating the future so that they can keep the people in Parliament accountable without only having the tool of standing outside the Parliament and hoping that people will listen. It may have taken a banking crisis to politicise the nation, but Iceland is now finding genuinely effective ways to hold the politicians to account, both in and outside Parliament. For me, this is how protests should function, working as a vital element of a healthy democratic process. God, I really love it here. I'm thinking of moving to Iceland. After seeing the success of the protest movement and the rise of the Pirate Party, I think this is really the place for an aspiring young protester like myself. Take away the cutlasses and the Pirate Party is at heart a very traditional protest movement, pursuing an accepted route to government. But today, most people think governments have no power anymore and that the real power lies with multinational corporations. That's something Greenpeace has been telling us for years, ever since the Rainbow Warrior became a global symbol of environmental protest and they pioneered headline-grabbing direct action campaigns. We've been given behind-the-scenes access to their latest stunt. For me, this is where the cheeky spirit of John and Yoko and the disruptive art of Zephyr Thrau combine to form some very creative ways of making their point. Which is why I'm now sitting in on a rehearsal for a protest. We're just going to work out who's the monkeys and who's the monkey minders. Hannah is a professional protester, but most people here are volunteers. Hannah. Yes. What are you doing? I'm trying to get 30 people to behave plausibly as monkeys. Oh my God. Tomorrow they'll be targeting engineering giant Siemens at their HQ in Surrey. And for this hush hush mission, they need some code words. What should we say? So we're spider monkeys. Spiders? Yeah. I think we need one clear word again to like pull us back. OK. Snakes? Something about this feels a bit odd. What are you doing? Who's in charge here? Hang on, hang on, monkeys. Snakes! <laughs> you didn't get very far that time. OK, let's do the chant. No! The Munduruku tribe from Brazil has approached Greenpeace as they believe their community could be under threat from the building of new dams. Greenpeace has flown some of them over for the campaign. I'm not sure if this is what the chief of the Monduruku signed up for. Greenpeace wants Siemens to rule out being involved in any future dam building in the Amazon and has requested a meeting with the CEO. 
Hannah, you know what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. But the people, the workers of Siemens, do not. No. How much thought has gone into that? We will be disrupting them. We hope that we can influence them to influence their bosses. We will be trespassing. But these are all activists who have been trained in non-violent direct action and are prepared to be arrested for, for what they believe in. <laughs> Alistair, in the film The Planet of the Apes, the monkeys are always the baddies. You're hoping to portray the monkeys as the goodies. Will you succeed today? I think so, because um, on planet Earth, the monkeys are the goodies, and we're the baddies. Can everyone line up, please? So this is what a professional protest looks like. You can wait there, please. With your good Maya. Still working. The head of Greenpeace is here, but does he know the code words? Some monkeys are going to follow you, but they're not going to go past the doors unless you say spiders. Someone from the building has come out to meet them, but it's not the CEO. So we'd like to actually come inside and have a meeting. Jürgen is not available today. Many and times we've written yeah. to him and asked for a um, meeting. There is somebody yeah. that I have that, that, can, that can speak to you, but can only allow a small um, number of you in. A meeting has been agreed with the head of HR, and the chief of the Munduruku is heading in. He gives an authenticity to this protest that, try as they may, it's difficult for these monkeys to replicate. I can't help thinking this all looks a bit daft. But the protest has struck the curiosity of some of the seamen staff. And, oh, look, here's the head of HR. Seamen say their CEO was unavailable at short notice and the head of HR was the most senior member of the executive team on site. No! They state they were happy to meet the Munduruku to understand their concerns and say the company is not involved in any bids or proposed bids for dam building projects in the Tapajos region of Brazil. No. So do Greenpeace feel their big budget performance has had any effect at all? We knew when we were coming here, we were talking to the employees of Siemens. We want them to go into the cafe at lunchtime and talk about why we came here. And we want them to bring that up with their bosses and have a discussion within the company. We want them to send pictures around the company and around their friends about what took place today. So you, you have to provide them with something to photograph and a story to tell. The Munduruku made their mark, but I'm not sure if the slightly unconvincing monkey costumes are enough to influence a huge multinational. Perhaps it was just a bit too overproduced, and the conspicuous absence of the media tells me it won't be making many headlines. Which brings me to the one thing that might have helped this Greenpeace protest gain more attention, a celebrity. The sad fact is that things would probably have been rather different if Leonardo DiCaprio was in one of those monkey suits. From Vanessa Redgrave to Bob Geldof, there's a long-established tradition of the celebrity protester. So I wanted to find someone with real profile to discover how effective this strategy is. We asked Bob Geldof and Bono, but they were busy. Luckily, Bez, the dancer from the 80s band The Happy Mondays, was available. He's reinvented himself as an anti-fracking protester. Bez, do you think your whole life has been a protest? I've always been a rebel, but now I'm a rebel with a cause, which is even better, you know what I mean? What uh, enabled me to bring uh, such uh, attention to the fracking issue was because I set up a political party. So do you think your celebrity brought something to the anti-fracking protest? People like you give me little platforms on odd occasions to blow me trumpet, you know what I mean? I would have free public transport for everybody, free food for everybody, absolutely free everything, in fact, you know what I mean? I've actually went door to door, knocking on people's doors, trying to... Uh, uh, what was the reaction when, when Bez banged on people's doors? I got all oh, every reaction, what a fucking knobhead. We even got death threats in there, uh, mm. Fanner, yeah, yeah. Bez. Are you the new Sting? Uh, I, I, I don't want to be a new Sting. Uh, I'm the boggly-eyed dancer from the fucking Mondays. <laughs> As the anti-fracking movement's chief celebrity lobbyist, I think Bez might have to work a bit on his PR. 
But it's hard not to love his enthusiasm, and it's been great talking to Bez and all the other unruly citizens I've encountered on my travels. <laughs> And however gloomy I might feel about the possibilities for real change, the one thing I've discovered is that there's no such thing as the protesting classes, just communities of people full of passion, conviction and sometimes anger. Let, let, let me ask you a question. Though they're certainly not all getting their way. In Lancashire, the frack-fighting nanas fought bravely but were recently defeated when the government gave the go-ahead for horizontal fracking. Though I'm sure it's not the last we'll see of them. In Iceland, Birgitta and her pirate party didn't quite get the number of votes to form the next government, but I'm wondering if that's a problem. There are pirates here from 15 countries. That's extraordinary. Woo! They seem to have sidestepped Parliament and talked to the people directly, loud and clear. Oh, yes, and in America, the disgruntled masses certainly took their revenge on the political establishment. The President of the United States of America, Donald Trump. Donald Trump, whether you like him or loathe him, became a kind of unlikely protest figure. He spoke to millions of disaffected Americans. We must reclaim our country's destiny. He was swept to power, not by a regular political campaign, but by a popular movement. To me, he's just a crude demagogue exploiting ordinary people's fears in a rapidly changing world. And I'm not convinced he's got the solutions his supporters crave. But there's no doubt he did lead the most significant protest vote the world has ever seen. Back in Britain, while we prepare for life in this uncertain and I think slightly scary Trump world, I want to do my own bit to change the course of history on Newnham Village Green. Not least because I could do with a drink now. And I'm using some of the tricks of the protest trade I picked up along the way. You've certainly got the numbers. Maybe four score. Four score. Got the weather too, Bob. Isn't that amazing? You've got the celebrity. That's me, I'm afraid. Now, I've got a couple of placards here. There you go, Nigel. God doesn't entirely hate soft drinks. He did institute the uh, Holy Communion, which you've got to have wine for, so... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let the protest begin! Ladies and gentlemen, every protest needs its moment of direct action. What on earth is going to happen? Oh, my God! <laughs> So, Richard, you're from the local paper. Do you think Newnham created its media moment? I certainly do. It's been a fantastic media moment and it's gonna be, it should be front page for the Basingstoke Gazette. All together now! I think they need a better protest song. We've got a lovely pub in Newnham. We're going to keep the pub in Unum here. We're going to keep Billy Bragg here. did say I should stick to painting. Here. Where? There? No, here. We're going to keep it here. If only the problems we face were as benign as saving a pub on a village green. But I think this carnival protest proves that the act of standing up, making your voice heard and expressing your anger and ideals remains as vital as ever, whatever the outcome.